Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, this is going to be the first video in the new series I'm going to be starting, which I'm starting today. Uh, I'm actually going to be starting two new series along with the opening theory, and I'm going to do them each one day and sort of shuffling between, depending on what I do for my training. Uh, this series is going to be endgame strategy, and this is something that I believe most players lack knowledge of and need experience in. And I'm going to be going through thematic endgames, not really paying too much attention to which games I choose. Uh, I'm going to be... Uh, what I mean is I don't care who the players are, I care that the endgame is interesting and thematic. and. This here you can see on the board, which I chose for the first video, is an endgame I actually messed up in, in my last uh, tournament game, or one before last. And it's bishop versus knight in a complex uh, endgame with a lot of pawns on the board. In this case, uh, it's seven pawns each, so it's a very rich position. And this is Reti Rubinstein. Uh, as you all probably know, Rubinstein is very well known for his rook endgames, but for his endgames in general, along with some other great players, probably Rubinstein is the best endgame player uh, from the early ages of chess, from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in this game, he's playing Richard Reti uh, in Gettenburg in 1920 in Sweden, or Jutibori as they see in Sweden, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, he has a bishop, Reti has a knight. Now, before we start, I would like you to pause the video and think schematically in this endgame. You are not looking for moves, you are not looking for a single line which you have to calculate. Calculation is important in the endgame, but before you do that, you need a plan, you need to find uh, a way to, to win in your head. Find an idea, find a winning idea, find uh, a plan to go forward. Not necessarily win in the next 10 or 20 moves, but what you will be doing to go forward. To do that, you need to understand your advantages and your disadvantages. And especially if you think you're better, uh, try to understand why you're better, uh, which side of the board you have the advantage on, how and what your opponent could do to prevent that and where your opponent's counterplay lies. What is he going to be doing? So pause the video if, if you want uh, and try to have a think. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in every endgame is think about improving our pieces, especially our king, especially our king in positions where we have a long range piece. So. This bishop is not hard to improve. Uh, it can move to any square, for example, d7, and control uh, the vast majority of the board. For the moment, it's putting pressure on the pawn on c2, so it's fine. So improving our king is always a good idea. So a move like king e7 is something you should think about, but not play automatically. Uh, what are the important features of the position? Well. The most important one, I would say, is this 2 to 1 pawn majority, potential pawn majority on the queen side, which means that if we somehow manage to weaken uh, white's queen side, we may be able to create a passed pawn. Uh, that being said, that's not easy to do because white has two c pawns, so that's something uh, way off in the future. For the moment, uh, let's think schematically about how a bishop could dominate a knight and how a bishop could be made worse in this position. Well, what I'm thinking about when I was analyzing this endgame, the first thing I thought about was what happens if white at some point plays f5? And I was really afraid of f5. If f5 is played, then it's really not that easy uh, to put my pawn on g5 and to prevent white from blockading my bishop. If there's a pawn on f5, then my bishop is definitely worse. And the only chance I have to activate it uh, properly is to at some point play d4, which is going to require my king being really close to the d4 square and black's king being far away or not defending the d4 square, which means that if the, the, the white king is uh, on e3, I'm never going to be playing d4 uh, because 
my king would need to get to d uh, to d5 and in most cases that's going to be very hard to do so i was afraid of f5 when i started analyzing <clears throat> so these are some very important features now let's start the end game if you understand what's going on you still need to play the correct improving plan first so let's start with king e7 this was played in the game king e3 was played by reti and king e6 by rubinstein preventing f5 for the moment I should mention that f5 wasn't possible uh, early on because you could undermine the whole structure with bishop d7 and h5. Uh, not that that resolves all the issues for black, but it was fine. Okay, and in this position, Reti continued g4, which is an extremely important move in this position. Now you can imagine if, if uh, f5 is played, this pawn is defended and the knight starts jumping into, into the position via f uh, via g2 and f4 and maybe even e6 then this knight would be dominating the bishop and not vice versa so in this position rubinstein actually made a mistake i think he was aware of the dangers for his position but he may have underestimated them he played king to d6 uh probably not wanting f5 to come with tempo and maybe playing for d4 if the white king moves away but this isn't the most precise move uh, what he should have done is g6 and this i think is the first critical position in the game uh, if g6 is played then it's very hard for white to make progress let's have a look at h4 which is the most logical move i believe we can just wait and if g5 is played which is something white would like to do to blockade the position a mistake which would probably lead to an easy draw for white would be f5 because now our bishop is dominated by our own own pawns the the knight of course has a beautiful square on e5 and we always have to look out for knight takes g6 h takes g6 let, let me just show you that if if for example knight f3 bishop d7 knight d4 let's just play a couple of stupid moves and let's i don't know play d4 uh, let's move the king far away in a position like this if we make several mistakes for example like this then knight g6 and this is now a lost end game so f5 would allow that possibility for white more importantly though since playing knight hg6 is almost never possible because white can black can at least keep the bishop here more importantly this mistake is uh, going to lead to an equal position because the bishop has no scope okay so after a move like g5 uh, black would be best advised to simply wait with either king to e6 and just praying that that black takes and then threatening takes and getting into the position or a move like bishop to d7 and if gf6 is played you're you're not really afraid of that you can just go bishop g4 trying to dominate the knight if f5 you play bishop f5 and this isn't going to be easy to win but uh black should have some chances so g g6 definitely should have been played against which h4 is the best reply since rubinstein played king to d6 and we know that f5 is a positional threat uh, f5 is a move we should look at now now Reti didn't play it but had he played f5 this i think is an easy draw and you can go bishop to d7 you cannot really go king to e5 because of d4 and this would definitely mean that white is the one holding all the all the advantages in the position especially with the knight coming to f4 and you're going to be stuck defending this pawn there is no way to win this so if you wait with for example bishop to d7 then d4 blocking in your position you can try g5 and after fg6 hg6 something like king f3 and white should be able to hold this i don't think there's an easy way to win however reti played the move h3 which doesn't do anything 
And now we are back to the pattern we were talking about. How do you prevent f5? In this position, Rubinstein played the correct move. He played g6. And now you are at least equal on the king side with your bishop having amazing prospects. Of course, you don't want to play f5 at any point by yourself, but you're preventing both f5 and g5. Uh, and in this position, if white continues f5, that would be simply dreadful because of king e5 and you, you lose a pawn. So after g6, Reti continued king to d2. Okay, now d4 was possible, I believe, but uh, first Rubinstein decided to improve his bishop and the idea of bishop to d7 is actually very strong. You want to play h5, weaken the pawn on h3, and if the pawn ever advances, your bishop has the g4 square. So this is, I believe, very strong. d4 was also possible. Knight f3 played, the, the pawn is not attacked anymore and the king is defending it anyway. King to e7, this is all fine. King to e3, and now pawn to h5. So the undermining starts. If you remember from the start of the video, we mentioned this pawn majority, potential pawn majority on the queen side, which could be very useful. And this is what Rubinstein is playing for. He wants to neutralize the play on the king side. He wants to activate his bishop to its fullest capacity potentially create some squares for his king and for his bishop uh, and h5 is a great way to do that of course if if you don't do anything uh, like Reti did uh, then black has to prove uh, that h5 is a good move Reti played knight to h2 and Rubinstein simply played king to d6 uh, I'll just show and knight h2 is probably correct uh, there is no other easy way to wait. If you if you take on h5, then gh5, and the position should be over. You have light squares for your king. You have light squares for your bishop. Uh, your f pawn is an amazing piece, actually, an amazing pawn because it's controlling all the squares, and you can see that everything is covered. There's basically no way for the white king to enter the position, and at any point playing f5 trying to create a square for your king on f4 would basically lose a pawn because in this position h3 is already hanging. So for example, if you play h4, then simply king e6, and now the king is marching in, and there's basically no way to save this. So h5 is a great trap. If you take it, you lose. So knight h2. King d6, fine. Uh, and now that the knight has been put offside, so basically the same threats are still in the position. If this pawn is ever taken, then we do the same thing. If the pawn ever advances, we can take, take, take on h3. Uh, if the h pawn advances to h4, we can take the g4 pawn. So it's not easy to find a good move for, for white, in my opinion. If you turn on the engine here, the engine plays a3, which, I, okay, fine. Uh, the engine also plays king to d2, and now white should, black should simply start marching towards the queen side. Uh, I'll just show you what happens after king to d2 and d4, and this is a very important position. So if d4 is played and takes and takes, then knight uh, f3 is actually an important tempo. So if you take and take and play, for example, here, then this should be equal. But if instead <clears throat> you play king to c5, then g5 is a very strong move. And again, this is basically impossible to win. Too much material has been traded off. And what's important is that uh, black's king is very close to the queen side and able to defend. So for example, if something like this happens, then the king is on time. So, finding a move isn't easy. The point being that after d4, uh, you're basically forced to take. If you don't take, then my king is going to advance further and I can do this. And then my bishop gets this great diagonal. So you have to hold, you, you have to defend a2 with your king. Reti blundered and with what I just showed you, it's going to be easy to understand why that's a blunder. But 
had I not shown you the king coming to a3, you probably wouldn't understand, which is normal. He played king to e2. And now the game is losing on the spot. Uh, the game is losing on the spot because basically the same thing, if we go through the same variation, d4, uh, cd4, cd4, knight f3, for example, we can just come in. Okay, let's take here first. Takes, takes, and, and here. And we are threatening bishop to g4, and we are threatening king to b4. So if g5 is played now, then here, here, and we can actually play bishop to, to g4, and the game is over. If the king tries to unpin, we can just take, and we are marching in. Okay, so... Uh, just a second. Okay, so king e2 was played, d4 was played in the game, cd4, cd4, and in this position, it's really not easy to suggest a move. Uh, Reti played king to d2, which is probably correct. Uh, if he tries c3, then dc3, and there's no more hope. 2 to 1 advantage, weakness, 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 weakness. If he tries f5, then simply hg4, and after fg6, we take here. Of course, our bishop is on time, also our king is on time. So, for example, if king f2, then we can just go king e7. Uh, the bishop defends the, the h3 pawn, game over. And if something like knight f3, like we saw in the previous position, then hg and so on. So he played king to d2. Uh, hg4 was played, hg4. And bishop to c6, and this is a very neat move uh, because it attempts to dominate the knight, uh, preventing it from going to f3, and it also prepares bishop to d5, which means that this pawn is going to have to move, which means that it's going to be closer to our king, and also, if we move our pawns forward, it's going to be easier to undermine with b4, because it's going to be on a3. So it's important... To put this pawn on a3, that's a very thematic idea, which I believe I wouldn't find in a tournament game because I didn't find it during analysis. I, I reached this point in the game and I knew that I could try getting my king forward and so on, trying to get to the queen side. But the idea with bishop d5 is, from a human perspective, extremely strong. So king e2 was played and now bishop d5. Uh, the pawn has to advance. And after a3, the engine actually gives the pawn away, saying that that's easier to try and hold. Uh, after a3, you simply go b5. You don't want to allow a4, uh, because maybe the pawn can advance to, to a5 and so on. And now it's game over. After knight f1, a5, and, and that's it. You're going to play a4, and then you're going to play b4 and queen your pawn. There is no more way to prevent any of that. A stronger move was actually g5, according to the engine, but I think for humans that's unnecessary. Uh, so takes, takes, and now after, for example, knight to g3, king to e5, you're basically going to pick up this pawn and then turn your head towards the, the queen side. And that's also fine, um, but it's not forced. a5 leads to a pretty forcing variation. King d2 was played, and now a4, uh, knight d2, excuse me, a4. A uh, 94 check is the final blunder uh, because it takes and this is just queening. Uh, or if king to d2, then b8, 3, king c1, and g5. And again, you're going to win all the pawns and then queen. Uh, again, if 94 isn't played, the position is still completely lost. Uh, if something like this, then you can just advance and then play uh, here and, and queen. Let's just go through the engine line. Uh, why not take on c3? Okay, the engine says bishop a2 is minus 5. dc3 is slightly less winning, like minus 2, but I believe it's it's still winning enough. I can just do this and then play b4. Yeah, it's still winning. Anything is winning. So coming back to the original position, the starting position. Uh, the three most important features here were the f5 blockade the d4 liberation uh, while we are able to attack the a2 pawn and then finally creating a threat of 
queening our a pawn by provoking the pawn to a3, blockading it with b5, and then playing a5, uh, a4, and finally b4. For that to happen, we need to get rid of this pawn. So ideally, the white king, if, if white is just trying to hold, not doing anything, he should play f5 as soon as possible and then keep his king on e3. And then maybe uh, Rubinstein wouldn't have been able to win this game. Now, the engine says black is minus one at the start in this position, which may or may not be enough to win. But from a human perspective, those factors which we went through were, were the most important ones. Okay, I hope you liked the first video in the series. Um, the second series I'm going to be starting is middle game strategy. So I'm going to be doing two things I've been struggling with most. One of them is complex endgames. And the other one is attacking middle games. So I'm going to be looking at complex endgames in this series and attacking aggressive, complicated, sharp middle games in the other one. Thank you for watching. Hope you got something from the video. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.